Good morning, Riverflow family. It's good to be with you this morning. So, so we are uh, excited about this morning just to share something about God's Word. And we, we are in a time where we can't gather together in the venue as we normally do. But, but you know what? We still keep on praying for you guys and we still keep on praying for uh, the government. We still keep on praying for uh, the healthcare workers fighting the fight in front. And, you know, prayer is something that really unites us. So, so that's something that we still do for each other. That's something that really unites us in these times. So, so just saying that, uh, let's open in prayer. And then, then we lift up God's word this morning. And we, we just really uh, ask God for, for his revelation in our hearts this morning. So, Lord, we thank you that we can, we can gather wherever we are, Lord. And we can be in agreement wherever we are about your word. Thank you, Jesus, that, that your word is eternal. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you remain the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we can, we can know that you are faithful, Lord. Lord, we open your word this morning, and we, we ask that you speak into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Good. So this morning, guys, I want to share something about change, and then also just something about about how good God is and that whatever has happened, we can listen to Him. And um, I want to start off by just saying how I was thinking about it, how things have changed even in the last few months, even in the last year. How many things in your life has changed? I can think of just a few things in my life. Kids growing up too fast, we got new neighbors, stuff at work changes, economy changes, more regularly than we think, stuff like that changes. And, um, and then I thought, how many things will still change over the next year? There's going to be things that will change and we might not even expect them. But change is one of those things, somebody once said that the only constant is change. So we can expect change to happen, it's going to be there uh, whether we want it or not. And um, I think throughout the Bible, we can also see that change was regular. You see from generation to generation in the, in the, in the Bible how change hap- happened, and, and also how people demanded change. Uh, uh, you, you read about the, the guys, and they, they said, no, we don't want a priest anymore, and, and then God gives them judges. and uh, No, we want a king. So they demanded some of those changes, and when the change happened, happens, they, they also don't always like that. So, you know, we are human, we're funny beings, and uh, change is one of those things that always will be there. So, I don't know how you deal with change. Some people love change. Change is as good as a holiday for some people. But for others, you know, change is one of those things that they don't like. I like my comfort zone, this is who I am. Don't, don't rattle that too much, and they will kick against anything that has to do with change. So, so I, I don't know how you deal with it. We all deal with it differently, but change is something that is constant. And, uh, you know, in a time where the world is changing constantly, we need to remember that we serve and we believe in a God that doesn't change. God doesn't change, but the times and the, the world does change. Um, so Dudley Daniel wrote in one of his books, um, he said, the world we live in is changing rapidly. And God himself continuously initiates change in our circumstances and lives. He is transforming us into the image of his son and preparing us and releasing us for his purpose. That's interesting, eh? Just the the perspective that he had there because, you know, God constantly initiates change in our lives for our benefit, for our growth, for us to be prepared and released for his purposes. You know, change, change doesn't always seem comfortable for us, but, but when we think about it this way, change is so good for us because it, it, it transforms us more into the image of Jesus. And uh, when we start seeing change that way, we might be more open to how God wants to grow us in, in times that are changing. So somebody also said, being flexible... We need to be flexible without being spineless. Just think about that. When things change, we need to be flexible and adapt and not be thrown out by everything. 
but we still need to be able to stand firmly on God's word, on our beliefs, our biblical beliefs and our convictions when we are faced with situations. We're not spineless, but we can be flexible. And I'm thinking of a guy like Joseph in, in the Bible. You know, Joseph was a great example that, that went through a lot of changes and, and he, I think he handled it well because he kept his eye on Jesus, uh, on, on God and the promises that God had, had given him. So think about it. Joseph was, first of all, he was the, the favorite son in the house. Then he became a slave, sold into slavery. Then he became a servant in the house. Then he became a, a tronk fool. He, became, he went to jail. And then from jail, all of a sudden, he's prime minister. We know the, the ongoing of, of his story. But throughout all those changes, Joseph always stood on God's promises. And he kept his, his convictions firm and, 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 and upright. Joseph didn't waver in those times. And it's, it's also like, um, like Abram. Abram is another example in Romans 4 verse 20 to 21. speaks about Abram. It says, Abram never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promised. You know, faith, uh, Abram had a, had a faith that, that wasn't shaken by everything that was going on around him or the natural circumstances. It says he never wavered and he, he still believed that God could do everything that he had promised. That, that's faith that we need in times like these. When, when things are changing, I, I don't believe it was easy for Abram. Uh, I mean, you know, age was against him. This was in the context of, of him having a son and age was against him I, I, I'm guessing people nudged him and say yeah, Abram you know you you passed the 90 year what are you thinking still thinking this is going to happen and and times around him wasn't easy and it, yet he still believed God was able to do what he had promised you know that we need a faith like that um, and also Joseph Joseph remember the dream that Joseph had of of the, the, the um, sheaves of grain that, were, that bow down before the other one. That was God's promise, in a sense, to him that that's what's going to happen. And, and later on, it did happen. And he was, he was still believing God's promise throughout all the changes, through jail, through servings, through slavery. He believed that God is faithful. You know, and it doesn't matter... The circumstances, because if you look at those guys' circumstances, you'd say, no, they were probably not doing what they needed to do. But you know what? Just because circumstances doesn't always look that good, it doesn't mean necessarily mean we're not in the center of God's will. Because if we look at things around us, we say, whoa, Lord, I'm getting this so wrong. What am I doing wrong? I want to be in your will. And then when things aren't going our way, we, we, we sort of think, no, I have to do something else. This isn't what God called me to do. And then I'm reminded of, of Paul. He was in the middle of a storm in a, in a ship that was going to be shipwrecked, and yet he was in the center of God's will on the way where he had to go. Storms around us doesn't mean we're not in God's will. It means the enemy doesn't like what we're doing in the kingdom. So, you know, comfort zones, often when, when change comes, it's when our comfort zones get stretched and, and shaken. And, and in some instances, not just shaken or stretched, it just gets ripped away. <laughs> like there's no comfort left. And when that happens, we can either kick against it and say, no, I want my comforts back, and throw our toys out of the cot, or we can see it for the opportunity that it is, where God maybe wants us to, to, to learn from this. It's an opportunity for us to be transformed into this, to, to his son's image. And it's both a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. It's not easy, but it's, it's, it's an opportunity for us to grow, and it's also a challenge for us to remain steadfast on our faith and our obedience to God. It's not always easy, but it's something that, that we need to, to learn to see. And when, when it happens, we, we need to have a good understanding of 
God's goodness and God's presence that, that can come. And, and I want to say His goodness and His presence needs to supersede all the realities of this world. Because that's when we're going to um, start, start walking in the things of God and in the promises that God has for us. So as we navigate through these changing times, we need to have our focus on Jesus. We need to be listening to God. We need to be in step with the things of God. And, and we want to we be a prophetic people as well. So as we listen to God, we want to, in obedience, walk into the things of His Word, into the prophetic things that He's got for us. And as I was just um, uh, praying over these things and, and praying for the years, well, God just gave me this, this picture of a, of a roller coaster. And, you know, I, I don't know how many of you's, you have been on a, a roller coaster, but it's both fun and exhilarating and nerve-wracking and everything at the same time because you don't know what to expect. And you do it for the adrenaline. And so you get in and, and you, there's the slow upward click, click, click as you go to the top and then there's this roller coaster that throws you this way and that way. Uh, you're not expecting any of the turns. And then at the end you come in slowly and you go and park and then people can get off, new people can get on or you can just remain seated. That was the most fun and then you would go again. And then all, it's, all of a sudden it starts again. The slow up ramp, click, 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 click to the top and then you're in the second round. And I had this, this picture, and just praying around it, I just feel like, you know, some people might have felt like they've been through a roller coaster, and now it's starting to click again, and they don't know if they're ready for the second round. It's like, we've been through this roller coaster, I don't want to do this again. And uh, like you were expecting to go in this direction, and then the roller coaster just flips you into a different one, upside down, inside out, feels like your stomach wants to jump out. Some, some might feel like that's been the year for them. And we can either think we're not ready for the second one, or we can have an attitude where we say, God, this isn't going to be easy, but if, if you're in it, I'm, I'm going to be ready for whatever comes. And that's where it has a lot to do with our faith. What, are, what do we have faith for when we know God is in control? What do we have faith for when we know that God, God has got plans and purposes for us. So, thinking about a roller coaster, you know, it's, it's nerve-wracking, but in a sense, the tracks are already laid. It's not like you're going to go left when the tracks go right. You, you on the tracks. It's not like it's unplanned. And it just made me think, you know, God is in control. The, the, the plans are set. It might be unexpected for us. We might feel like we're going left and then thrown right, but but if God's in control, it means that he's got, he's got a plan and a purpose for that. So, so God is in control, the tracks are set, and prophetically speaking, I'm thinking more about the, the older type of um, roller coasters. I know you get single track ones and hanging ones and everything, but, but the, the double track ones are almost like a train track. And uh, just saw it prophetically as, you know, the tracks are laid, the Word and the Spirit, and there's a parallel between the two. And as we walk in the two, we're walking in the things of God. And, um, and we should have this balance of walking in the fullness of God's Word, but also in the fullness of God's Spirit. And, and that's, that's the, the balance that we need as Christians. So, so we need a theology. We need to build our theology and our beliefs on the Word of God. We need to be immersed in His Word in the, in the living water, and that's where we're going to get our convictions from. So as we, as we get our theology from there, then we're going to get a theology that, that, that is going to grow us to, to be able to, to go through the realities of life, to, to have an attitude of a Christian, a true Christian, in times where the realities of life seems different. And to have a theology that, you know, when, when there's people speaking about things and asking questions, that, that we can have a theology that says, you know what, I'm okay with not knowing those answers because I know the Word says this about God. It's okay not to know all the answers because I know Jesus. And uh, is our theology strong enough to, be, to stand firm on that? And in the same way, are we in tune and listening to the Holy Spirit as we, as we live our lives? Because... You know, Revelation speaks about the seven letters that, that's written, 
it, it always ends with, uh, with, the, with the words that says, anyone with ears to hear should listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. There's something of, a, of, a, of a, us listening to God, what is He saying, and then understanding it in the context of what He's saying to church as well. And then just a, maybe something on the, on the lighter side, but you know what, when we, when, when we look at the realities of life, we can, we can decide what our attitude will be in a sense with this thing. So are we going to kick against it or are we going to be the, the example that, that takes things as they come with a firm faith, believing in who Jesus is? So I've just got a picture that, that I want to show you. It's a... It's actually a, a older style roller coaster with a few ladies on there, and it's a matter of perspective. So I don't know about you, but some of those ladies are just so enjoying it. And if if you see them laughing, it's almost so contagious. You feel like you want to go on that roller coaster as well. But then, if you look a little bit to the top, the, I think the backseat ladies, it's not like they really want to be there. It's uh, like their attitude is really. I don't want to be here, this is not fun, and, and you sort of see it directly in their face. And people will always be looking at, at us as Christians. When we go through tough times, when we go through a roller coaster, people will look at us and see how are we reacting, what's our attitude with this thing, are we, um, what are we saying, how are we saying it, are we losing our faith in these times? Or are we the ones that have got this contagious attitude that is enjoying it? Don't always want to say enjoy it because, you know, out of your comfort zone, stretching times, it's not always enjoyable, but it's good for us. And, and we can be the Christians that are a good example. So are we the front, front seat ones that are setting the example or are we the ones that have the attitude of, you know what, I don't want to be here. And um, it's a matter of influence because... Um, I just thought about, about the, the, the circle of influence again. I, I remember that, that, that teaching about that. Just, just influencing those around you. If you can have an attitude that influences the guys around you, that's more than enough because that's being faithful with, with what and who God has given us. And then just the last, last point on, on the roller coaster is, you know, it's when you're in the middle of the roller coaster, it's not a time to jump ship. You don't want to, in the middle of the roller coaster, disengage from your safety belt. And it's also, in times of roller coasters, it's not a time where you don't want to be plugged into the body. It's times where you need to remain plugged in because you're going to need, you're going to need the family, you're going to need the church in these times. And not only do you need the church, you need to be the church to others next to you who maybe need it as well. So... People will always look how we handle things, so let's remain plugged in and, uh, and be the ones that encourage others. I want, uh, I want you to open your Bibles to Luke 5, uh, if you've got it with you. And we're going to be reading Luke 5, to w- verse 1 to 11. And this is just an incredible portion of Scripture that, that Jesus comes to the lake, he gets into the boat, into the boat of one of the disciples, and then... Uh, it says the crowds were pushing against him and then they got into the boat and they were a little offshore and he was just giving a teaching to the guys in the morning. And um, I'm going to read from verse 3. It says, He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, the context here is really that, you know what, fishing was a nighttime experience. So they have been out all night fishing and they didn't really catch anything. And now Jesus comes to them, uh, he gives this teaching, and, and I would love to know what teaching it was because it obviously stirred Peter for the, for the answer that he would give now, but... I wonder if Jesus maybe shared something about perseverance or obedience and in the kingdom of God, and, and that really stirred Peter, because I don't know about you, but, um, but these guys must have been really tired, and now they've just sat through a teaching of Jesus as well, and I think they want to 
like head home. And now Jesus tells them, no, let's go fish again. And not only does Jesus tell them that, you know, Jesus was a carpenter. He knew how to work with wood. And, and now the carpenter is coming to the fisherman who's been doing this for years, and he tells them how to fish. <laughs> I don't know about you, but normally we don't do well with people coming to us and telling us how to do our job, especially if they're not in the trade. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> It's like a fireman coming to a doctor and telling him, this is how I want you to operate me. <laughs> or, I don't know, use any example that you want, but we normally don't do well with this. And now Peter, in this scenario, is being told how to fish. He knows that daytime is not the best time. And, and then, yeah, doesn't matter. The response comes in Luke 5. So I love the way Peter replies to him. Because it says, Simon answered, Master. First of all, he, he recognized him not as carpenter Jesus. He recognized him as master. And that's why he could listen to Jesus. He recognized something of the authority of, of who Jesus was. And he said, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Just again, stating the obvious. That's Simon. And, uh, and then he says, we caught nothing, uh, didn't caught anything. But because you say so, I will lay down the nets. Just love that, that answer because, you know, yes, they are tired. Yes, they didn't catch anything. Yes, I know how to fish. But, Master, because you say so, because of who you are, Jesus, I'm willing to do it again. And, you know, for a, a fisherman to not catch any fish is a disaster. It's almost like a salesman not selling anything or a doctor seeing no patients, or a hairdresser seeing no clients, or a farmer having no harvest. It's, it's sort of that context where fishermen have got no fish. And then Jesus tells him, throw your nets out again. And I, I want to I encourage us to, to, to try and step into this, this platform where, where in, in the mind of Peter or in the mind of Simon, that, that he looks at the scenario and he says, but Lord, because you say so, I'll do it again. Whatever comes in this season, whatever comes in this roller coaster, the second round um, coming, I'm okay with that because you say so, Lord. If you say so, I'm going to do it. You know, we've, we've all been through stuff in this year, and, and whether it was a lack of work or no work at all, it's been affected. Uh, everybody's been affected. And now, in a sense, God wants to encourage us and say, you know what, try this one once more. And, and we have to be in a place of faith and um, unwavering faith like Abram and, and Joseph, I want to say, that says, Lord, because of your promises that you've given us, because you say so, Lord, that's because you say so, I'll do it. I'll be ready for whatever comes this season. And yes, it won't be easy, but... I want to have the attitude that knows I, I, I'm a child of God and I'm, I can deal with whatever comes. Because with any, any form of discomfort or challenge that we get, God has always given us the skill and the ability to overcome this very same challenge that we've got. He doesn't give us a challenge and then says, uh, see what you can do. He says, I've also given you the very skill or the answer that you need in that time. So you know this portion of Scripture, it goes on and, and they do what Jesus says. They lay down the nets and as they were fishing, the nets really started to tear because the fish were so much. And what they had to do is they actually had to call some of their partners, the, the other boats around them. They would normally fish in, in, in like partnerships, a few ships together. And they would have to call them because the fish were too much. And then their boats would fill up as well. And in this season, it's like God's calling us to say, you're going to have partners around you. You're not going to do this thing alone. It's, it's not something that you, you're going to lose out on. You're going to have enough to, to share with others. You're going to have enough to, to call on some of the partners in church that may be needed, that, that, that also have been with you for years. You can call on them as well. And then coming back to shore... Peter comes to Jesus and he just falls to his feet. And he says to Jesus, you know what? 
I'm a sinful man. And then he says, Lord, I'm sinful. And it just, this miracle brings Peter to the point of coming to the feet of Jesus and just saying, you know what, I recognize, I recognize who you are, your majesty. And in the same time, Peter recognizes his insufficiency as, as him, as human. You know, that uh, the goodness of God brings man to repentance like this. And the more that we're going to encounter, uh, walk in the presence of God and encounter His goodness, the more we ourselves, please Lord, start with us, but the more people will encounter His goodness and that will bring people to repentance. Um, because, you know what, nothing changes our hearts like encountering Jesus in that way. Because then we know who He is, the fullness of who He is, and we also see how small we are in comparison. And, and you know, Peter, you just see the example of how Jesus works with Peter here, and uh, he, he, he wants him to learn from this experience because God's got bigger plans for Peter as well, and he's preparing him for something of, a, of the future that he's got for Peter in, in the kingdom. And he wants to see how Peter handles, handles things. And you know, Peter wasn't always an easy one to, to deal with. Peter had his own... He wasn't spineless. He, he was opinionated and he was strong. And, you know, you see, you see later on, he didn't deal well with uh, change as well because Jesus would tell, tell the disciples, I'm telling you, I'm going to die. And then Peter would be the one that says, no, Lord, you can't die. You can't go. I won't let it happen. And then later on, says, Jesus says to him, no, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He says, no, Lord. No, I won't. Just in a way, Peter, he was stuck on his guns and he, he wasn't going to see change in that way. But, but, you know, God is gracious in the way that he deals with Peter because at some instances he had to rebuke him, he had to discipline him strong, but it was for his growth. And then later on we see the, the gracious side where Jesus comes to, to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? And then three times and he says, yes, Lord, I do. And then Jesus says, so feed my sheep. And just the, the way that God deals with him from a tough side and then this gracious, tender side that, that, that he brings through and, and he allows Peter to grow. And then we see in the early church the way that Peter was used for that. Jesus knew how to deal with Peter and he knows each one of us as well. So he knows how to deal with each one of us. He knows when to be strong with us and he knows when to be gracious with us as well. So just the last verse, almost closing it uh, in Luke 5, verse 10 and 11. So the last two verses there says, Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will, be, you will fish for people. So he pulled their boats up to shore. They left everything and they followed him. You know, in, in this interaction we just see how Jesus just wants to reassure him. Don't be afraid. I don't want you, Peter. And, and that includes all of us. To be afraid. He wants us to, to come to him with everything. He wants us to come with boldness, with peace, uh, to, to, to come and meet with him and speak with him. Fear should never be the thing that we link when we think of going to God. When we go, go to God and there's a fear linked to that, then, then we're missing the relationship that Jesus wants with us, that Jesus died for on the cross for us. That's not what he died for on the cross. And then just this very specific purpose that he, that he calls Peter for. And he, and where he says, you will now fish for people. You will be a fishers of people. And, and you know what? Fishers of men. This is just God saying to him, Jesus saying to him, I know what you've been doing. I know who you are. You are Simon the fisherman. And I want you to take that very understanding that you've got of fishing and I want you to apply it in kingdom because that's how I feel about my people. And, and you know, it's, it's n nothing new for Jesus to do this, because in the Old Testament we see that God spoke to Moses and he spoke to David. They were both shepherds, and, and God said to them, I want you to be shepherds of my flock. But that means that God is interested in our vocation or what we do, because what we do gives us understanding and it gives, gives us our qualities that we have in life. And, and, and Jesus wants us to, 
to live in the fullness of who he created us to be and then take that understanding and say, Jesus, is this how you feel about your church? If, if, if you're a farmer, this is the way you, 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 you look after your lands and you want the harvest to come out. If you are a fireman, is this the way, Jesus, that you, you feel about your people? You want to run into fires and save them from that. Whatever context you've got of working is the context that God has given you in your heart for people as well and for his church. So the unique gifting that he's got for each one of us, that's the calling that he's got for us, to be fishers for him and to be whatever you are, to be that for Jesus and to be that for kingdom. <clears throat> so that's it. How will we react to change that is coming? Because change is inevitable. What will our response be? Will we have an attitude for other people to see and be encouraged by it? Or will we be the ones that join the conversations of negativity? Will we, will we be the ones that, that try to find answers in our theology and our beliefs? Do we find that from friends or newspapers or Facebook? Or do we find our theology and our, our beliefs in God's word where we can stand firm? So the, if this is a roller coaster, then I want to be like Peter and say, Lord, because you say so, I want to be ready for whatever comes. Not just in it for the adrenaline, but, you know, we're in it for kingdom Jesus. We want to be fishers for men as well, like Peter. And Lord, because you say so, we want to do it. Let's close our eyes. Jesus, I want to thank you that that you are the constant in all of this. Thank you that your word, in your word you say that you remain the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we want to we want to glorify you, Lord Jesus. Lord, when when things in this world is not the way we think it should be, Lord, may we hang on to your word instead of look at the waves around, Lord. May we be like the disciples, Lord Jesus, that people could look at and they could see they, they were recognized as men that have been with Jesus. Lord, we want to be the same disciples that, that have been with you, that people will see we have been with you, Lord. Lord, because you say so, we want to go into this next season, this next year, that with the, with the faith to, to take on whatever comes. Lord, I thank you that your, your goodness, your provision, your grace is enough for us, Lord Jesus. In our sufficiency, we realize your, your uh, everything we need, Lord Jesus. I want to thank you, Lord, that we can, we can be who we are and the fullness of who we are, and we can step out in kingdom, for kingdom, just the way you made us, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you made each one of us unique. In Jesus' name, amen.